Welcome again. I am hopefully sharing my screen of the textbook. Everyone sees the textbook? No. Do, do, do. Now you see the textbook. Okay. So I can't zoom. PDFs are not as friendly as websites, which is why I make a website. Um, but we are doing chapter two, decimal review this week, which is a bizarre chapter. Um, first of all, it includes stuff we already talked about. We talked about place value, writing decimals, and rounding last week because those were exemplary topics for you not feeling bad if some of this review week is stuff you've never seen before. Almost everyone shows up at LCC with something or another, maybe lots of things that their older math teachers just never taught them. It's not their fault. And part of my job is to fill in all those blanks. So we've already done some of chapter two. Also, it includes ratios and rates, which are not decimal things, really. So it's kind of funny they're tucked in the decimal chapter, but we'll just roll with it. OK, um, in my thing, I can do control G and just jump to page 45. That's, anyway, that's now. I'm not going to spend a lot of time just looking at the textbook with you. You can always look at it on your own. But I want to compare what this looks like with what happened in our um, lectures last class. So we have learning about place value and lots of example problems. Can you identify the name of place value things? Can you write out numbers that have lots of words instead of numbers? All of that you appeared to be okay with last week. Last week we did. In the decimal accuracy, we had colorful pictures of place value that we skipped over but didn't talk a lot about. We can do these now if you want. You can always look at the answers yourself. And we could have named place value digits here, but we skipped over that. And Math 20, I certainly would have done that. We can do this now if you want. What we did do was the, can you find where the rounding error was? Remember that from last week? And for most people that have been through Math 20, that's a good like icing on the cake thing. So if you want more place value, let me know now. Raise your hand in Zoom or say something in chat. Otherwise, I'll just keep going in our book. OK, if you do need more and you're shy, ask me for office hours or look at those other links or things like that. OK, rounding, we talked a lot about rounding and had that general rule that stay with the same number of digits that the problem gives you. Yes, Renee, question. No, just hand up. No, I was you were saying to raise your hand if you want to learn more about that. And I did, but I don't know how to take that off. <laughs> no, we can. Let me pick one to do. That is a good one. Um, The thing that most people have trouble with and will be a good review, so let's just go ahead and do that, is putting decimals in order. So I'm going to do number six on our gym board. So place value review. This will not be a waste of time for people, even if they didn't raise their hand.
So stare at these four numbers as I'm copying and resizing them. We want to put them in order from smallest to largest. How do we do that? And how would you explain it to somebody if they weren't as sure about it as you are? And if you want to join the Jamboard, you can grab these and drag them around as you talk, or you can just boss me around. I will be your scribe. And you can say, move this to the top, move that to the bottom. Everyone's quiet. Somebody start our discussion. Or maybe not. Maybe I will start our discussion with something else. If I wanted to just draw, since we're looking at these decimals, point 0.5, how would I draw that on my 10 by 10 grid? You could put the, like you could put it on the, um, like a half of one of those boxes would be 0.5. Yeah. Um, it depends on what I'm defining it as. I want the whole grid to represent one, not the whole oh, okay, grid I see. to represent 100. So if the whole thing was 100, then your answer would be right. But I want the whole thing to be like one amount. Would you just, like shade in half of the whole grid then? Since yes. It's five. Okay. You can think just 0.5 means a half, I know that. Or you could think that this is one tenth and we have five tenths, right? Since we're studying place value. So five tenths, one, two, three, four, and five. Everyone with me so far? That's a good way to represent 0.5. Now, what if I switch colors and say, I want 0.57. I have five tenths and seven hundredths. So for the next line, you fill out seven boxes? Everyone see why? Each box is a hundredth of my entire big square. So I have seven hundredths. Like you just filled out nine there, David. Oops, I did. Because I'm thinking about what I'm saying next and not what I'm doing now. Okay, now five, seven, four. Oops, as a. This is getting trickier. Think back to how we journey started us. So would you be putting in like half or so like two to fill in like four halves or four thousandths? Four thousandths. I would have to take one of these, one of these that is a hundredth, and break it into ten parts. Oh, ten. Okay. Right? So I would need like four parts of that out of ten shaded in less than half of that box. Everyone with me there? My artwork is terrible, but you get the gist of what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to shade in less than half of this box, not 0.5 of it, but 
0.4 of it, four thousandths of the whole thing. And if I was to keep going with a two, then I would have to say, this one is really going to be beyond my artistic skill. I would need to take a box somewhere and say, let's take one tenth, and then we're just gonna take two tenths of that tenth, just like a little corner of a thing. And I should stop because at this point I am confusing you with my artwork more than I am helping you with my math concept, but you get the gist of it. So now this might help people explain what to do over here. Back to our original problem. Tell me how to arrange these four things in order, which one goes first and so on, and maybe relate back to my colorful picture for why. Well, for me, it really helps that you just arrange them vertically and lined up the decimal point as opposed to what, seeing them horizontally, because then you can start comparing them by proceeding step by step one place to the right of the decimal point, comparing the fives, those are the same, comparing the sevens, those are the same, and then we're about comparing the hundredth column. So all four of these, as Rick is mentioning, have the same five green things shaded. There's no difference in them there. By the way, I'm not answering Dulcie's question in chat. Let me talk a little more and then tell me if I've answered it. The sevens, all four of these have the same seven right there. So the blue is all the same. They all have 700 boxes. But three of them have a four, and one of them has a nine. So when we get to the tenths, hundredths, thousandths digits, then this one is different than the others. This nine would mean that we have almost all of this box filled in, rather than less than half of it. We'd have nine tenths of one little box. So does that mean that this one is bigger or smaller than all the others? Bigger. Bigger, okay. So I'm gonna move it kind of down to the bottom to be extra clear about that. Then the four was all the same, two, nine, and nine. What does that tell us? That the one with the two is smaller. Yes, this is my smallest one. The others have almost all of a tenth in the yellow tiny little bit here. The tenth, hundred, thousandth, ten thousandth part but the two is smaller. And then for these, we're comparing it, there's a one and a zero. What does that tell me? Uh, the one that has the one smaller. The one that has the one, it's not gonna be smaller than the zero. The zero is going to be smaller for tenth, hundredths, thousandth, ten thousandth, hundred thousandths. This one has one and this one doesn't. So having one of those makes it bigger. So this needs to go down there. So that's our final ordering. <clears throat> so all the fives were the same in tenths, all the seven were the same in hundredths. The smallest of the thousandths goes up above the big one. The smallest of the ten thousandths goes up above. And then the smallest of the hundred thousandths goes up above.
Okay, Delzi, did I answer your question in chat well enough by now? Yeah. Okay, more questions about this one? Are we ready to move on? Let me check if you're ready. There's a big nine here. How come that big nine doesn't make our first number bigger than our second number? Because the one ahead of it had a two in the hundredths place instead of a nine, mm -hmm. or the thousandths place. So think about some big number like Bill Gates's income, right? If Journey has more of the tenth, hundredths, thousandths, ten thousandths of Bill Gates's income than I do, it doesn't matter if I have more of the hundred thousandths income. This is a, a bigger chunk of the pie. So she has more of the big chunks. If I happen to have a lot of small chunks, that's not as significant. Okay, I think that was well worth our time. Move to the next page, go back to our textbook. Okay, did they ask you to put things in order? No, they don't. Oh, well, rounding. We didn't have trouble with that. Okay, 2.3 is multiplying and dividing by powers of 10. Here we're talking about shortcuts. And unfortunately, the textbook is a little awkward. They are writing multiplication by putting two numbers next to each other with the second one in parentheses. And that just looks kind of weird if you're not used to it. So I'm going to go and talk about this on my website lecture notes, just because it probably looks a little nicer. Okay, so where I am going, I'm going to do the shape shifting, um, doing things with one number. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm going to mad science. We're doing things with two numbers, right? Did I put it in one number? No, it is one number. Okay, it is the shape shifting, changing just one number at a time, scrolling down to decimal point scoots. I guess it is kind of two numbers, but we're using the scoots for percent, so I have to do one here. Okay. This is probably something you've seen before, but like many things, it's often rusty or just not explained quite as well as you might have wanted. So let's go through it carefully. If I'm multiplying by powers of 10, what is my pattern going to be? So I'll put that on our jam board. And remember that these little brown numbers that are coming after the subsections are where they were in the old Math 20 textbook. So let me see who is here and who is asleep by launching another poll. Did anyone actually go out and buy the Math 20 textbook knowing I could pay you back at the end of the term? term? I'm only seeing 11 out of 16 people responding. The rest of the people must be only pretending to be here. Uh, 
Oh, we're up to 14. That's pretty good. Okay. I will take that and stick it here. Um, let me just show you a little bit about that just for the people. I am not expecting anyone to do the buying the textbook. If you do, it is your own business, except until the end of the term when I have to pay you money. Um, but let me show you again how that works, that you would go to the any place that has a subtopic, go down to the red Math 20 homework and click on the book there. Once you've done it once, you could, of course, bookmark it not have to find it again. And we just saw section 4.3. So you could go section 4.3 and see lots of examples, lots of videos about how these work and so on. So if you need more Math 20 review, then this is an easy way to get it. That's very friendly. Okay, but enough about that. We are on decimal points. Oops. Oh, okay. So what is the pattern when we're multiplying by powers of 10? Tell me what to write for A, B, and C here. Um, you're essentially moving the decimal point to the right by however many zeros there are. Okay. So by 10, you would move the decimal point in front of the four. So there. Times 100. And so you'd move it in front of the five. And for C, you'd move it in front of the six. That ring a bell for everybody? I'll let her raise your hand if you've never seen this before, because in the beginning, most people have. Okay, let's try and confuse you. Now, if I divide, what happens? You're gonna move the decimal to the left. Yes, so, so moving at the same amount, but the other direction. What happens when I kind of go past the front of this number here? You put a zero there. So it would be 0 0.123. And I will talk about this now. If I was just doing a math with a friend, if I was with you by ourselves in an office hour, then I might not put that zero in front. I could just say point one two three four five six, and we all know what's happening. If I am lecturing, then I'm always going to put the zero in front. And that's just so when I'm reading things out loud, your ear gets this little heads up warning, zero point, right? And that way, you know a decimal is coming. It's not like one is more correct or incorrect as far as the number. You don't have to write the zero in front. But for lecturing clarity, I do. Okay, I'm gonna confuse you more. Now we're going to multiply by 0.1 and 0.01 and 0 0.001. It's the same thing as division you'd be moving the decimal to the left instead of to the right. Okay. So Jordan is claiming it's the same as before. Anyone disagree before we just believe him?
So then, for what he's saying, <clears throat> you'd move the decimal like more to the left for each zero that's in front of the, or that's technically behind the decimal. Yeah, so let's talk about that. That's a great thing to mention. As a math brain person, I am thinking that what I'm not writing, but really should have for all of these is times one to start with, which means don't move it at all. Or divided by one to start with, which means don't move it at all. And starting from there, if I did a decimal point scoot here, made a one into a 10, that makes a decimal point scoot there. If I did two decimal points to make a one into a hundred, then I need two decimal points here. So counting zeros is what everyone is taught to memorize when they first see this. But it, it's really kind of how did you get there from one? The same with 78. We started with one, so we did one scoot to get from one to a 10, so we do one scoot here. And again, we memorize the rule the first time we get it as count the zeros. If I was to write these numbers as not 0 0.1, but instead just 0 0.1, or instead of 0 0.01, or instead 0 0.001, again, that's a completely fine way to write those three numbers. It's not like this or this has more right or wrong to it. But if you choose to write it this way, then the little thing we memorized about count the zeros doesn't work anymore. Maybe you memorized the decimal point counts as a zero. Maybe you were taught to always put the zero in front of the decimal point so the count the zero rules does work. Whatever little thing that somebody taught you to put it in your brain, what they really should have taught you was we're going to start with a times one and say, how did I actually get to this number? Well, I did a one point, one decimal place scoot to the left, so I have to do it here also. Whether or not I write that with a zero in front of it or not is just kind of personal taste. So make whatever rule in your mind works. So you can think about my green times ones. You could always force yourself to write the zero in front of the decimal point like you're a lecturer and then memorize the count the zero rule. You can not write that and think that decimal points count as a scoot also, something like that. We're almost done, let's finish up. The last combination we have is to now I'm dividing and I'm having the decimal points. If you don't know this, just try it on the calculator or your phone. Which way does it go? So would it go, would it be like multiplying? It is, it's the first thing we did. The same issue about you need to figure out your rule happens here for how many scoots. Why does dividing by an itsy bitsy amount make things bigger? Remember we talked about the two different types of division last week. If I have four divided by one half, that means I am taking four things 
I am cutting them in half. And then I'm making piles of size one half. So that will become one pile, two piles, two parts of that first circle, three, four, five, six, oops, seven, eight. What am I counting? One, two, 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 two. Top bottom, top bottom, top bottom, top bottom. Okay. So my artwork is terrible, but you get the idea that this is one pile of a half. That's another pile of a half. Four divided by one half is eight. When I am dividing by a tiny thing, I'm making piles of parts, parts of a whole. So I get more than I started with. I think you accidentally put 10. I did. Okay. Oh, okay. Then you're not paying me for artwork. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yay. Now it's correct. So don't be surprised. Dividing by a tiny thing gives you something bigger. There's nothing surprising about that. We're making separate piles of tiny amounts. Questions about this slide? Okay, let's go back and look at our book. So they're trying to tell you that in different ways. Again, when they're writing a number next to another with parentheses, that's just one of their ways to write multiply. Don't be frightened by it. And... Every now and then it will get even worse. Pay attention to this one problem. There's like a space that shouldn't be there after the comma. So that's just 435,091.3. That space doesn't mean anything. It's not supposed to be there. Okay, ready for ratios and rates? Okay, yep, thank you. Oops, no. I hit okay to the wrong person in chat. Um, okay, ratios and rates. They have lots of example problems. Again, they will write multipli multiplying as, um, I can't highlight it. I'm over on the right hand side where there's a red 100. They're using parentheses to write multiplying in the middle of page 58. So don't be scared by that. Um, and I think everything else you can handle with my introduction. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my website and talk about ratios and rates for seven minutes and then we'll be done. So I'm still in shape shifting, changing one number at a time. Let's look at what ratios and rates are. The fractions we've thought about so far this class are what we call proper fractions. They're like cake slice numbers. The top always uh, counts how many pieces we care about. And the bottom, the denominator is how many pieces there are total. So if I want to write three quarters, we often picture that like, here's the thing, we'll chop it into three and we care, chop it into four and we care about three of them. Everyone okay with that? We will also use the same ink on a page to mean something very different. And that's what we'll call a ratio. When is a fraction not a fraction? Let's think about this. If I have one fifth, that's the same as one divided by five because fraction bar just means division and that's 0.2. But 
I would never say, let's take 10 divided by five and reduce it and get two divided by one and then get two. There are some tools we have for fractions that we don't use for division. And in order to access those tools, we often want to have ratios. So a ratio, we are comparing two numbers and we are writing it as if it's a fraction, but it's not. We're writing it that way to give us access to our fraction tools. This might be that there's four students in the class and three of them are right-handed. It might be there's four people in the family and three of them have brushed their teeth. Those are situations where the bottom still means the total and the top is how many are the special ones we care about. It is still a proper fraction. But we could make a comparison where the bottom isn't the total. We could say there's three left-handed people and four right-handed people and compare those. Or I could say I drive three miles every four hours if I'm very, very slow. So it's not always going to be part over whole anymore. So talk, lecture talks about that. You've hopefully seen this already since you should have gone through Math 20 sometime in your life. If this is a lot of review, read this carefully. And when we put labels on it, then we call it a rate. So maybe this time it is three right-handed four left-handed or something like that. When I ask you to write your problems neatly in homework, it's always important to label the rates that are supposed to have labels. We'll get to why when we get to cross multiplying and proportion stuff. Don't get sloppy and leave off the labels. Okay, so that's a small section, videos, practice problems, right? So do what you need. A unit rate is where it gets more interesting. Now we pretend we're at the grocery store. We want to change the second thing to one, and we do that just by dividing. Again, fraction bars are just division waiting to happen. But it's important to realize that sometimes we are making choices that our study partner might not make the same choice. So let's look at this shopping example. I could get 10 ounces for $5, or I could get 24 ounces for $8, which is the better buy. Some people might picture shopping in their mind like being at a gas station. They pull up, they hand the attendant a dollar, and they say, I want as much as I can get for my dollar. Those people will do the division with 10 divided by five or 24 divided by eight, and they will pick the bigger number. Everyone with me so far? Other people imagine they're at the bulk food section of the grocery store. I needed coconut flakes for some cake for my friend that likes coconut. I hate coconut. I don't want any extra coconut flakes. I just want to buy that amount of them and pay as little as possible. So for that person, they're going to do dollar divided by how much and say, I want to pay as little as possible for my bag of coconut flakes. They'll pick the smaller number. It's going to be the same one. It's always the $8 for 24 ounces is the better buy. But one way of thinking you pick the bigger division answer, the other way you pick the smaller. By the way, most people like this. But be a heads up, if you're a common way your brain works, your study partner might do the other way and don't scold them just because they pick the smaller answer as long as they're doing it with the right division. But that's all we're doing. We're taking one number of our rate, dividing it by the other and getting an answer. 
So I am out of time. Uh, a 12 pound ham has 16 servings. How many servings per pound? The servings comes first, that's the 16. The pounds come second, that's the 12. The per tells you to put the division symbol between them. So do things in order, servings per pound. 16, division symbol, 12, right? And then you get the right answer. Hopefully that was all review. If not, then either stick around or contact me or come to a study session tonight at five or other times. And it's only division, dividing one thing by another, but if you haven't seen in a while, it can be tricky. Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording. Thank you. If you